Great. So I've been involved with technology in some way or another for quite some time. And what I can say is that some things change and some things stay the same. One thing that I hope will change is at the moment we have these silos. We have art on the one side and we have engineering on the other side and everything's boxed and there's this big no man's land in the middle and you can't live there. And I want to tell you that it's not true. There's this wonderful overlap and there's amazing stuff that happens in between. And I'm also going to tell you, when you do something new, you're going to feel lost, you're going to feel alone, and you're going to feel like a failure often. So just get used to it. It's part of the rhythm. <laughs> a right. little bit of background of me to give you an idea of why I'm saying that. My mom is a brilliant artist, Charlotte Jans von Fieren, and my father actually studied um, in the States, and he brought back Apple II, and I played Frogger on it, and I thought everybody had an Apple II at home, which of course they didn't. But that's my reality. I was like, oh, I'll never do you know, um, computers and stuff. I'm going to go into the art. So I went to the art school, and it's amazing. There's like, uh, kids who are doing you know, music and painting and drama, and, you know, and I was painting. I'm going to be an artist. Um, and then you go and you try to find a job or you try to make a living as an artist, and it's really hard. So next step I thought, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to do something more in my father's line. So I decided to do desktop publishing. Um, and I tried to go and get a job and I, I phoned them and they didn't even want to give me an uh, you know, a interview. And it's only when I did the research for the TED talk that I realized Photoshop was only two years old. They probably didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was like devastated, you know. <laughs> Nobody wants me. <laughs> and then I went and I did a... Um, I said, okay, I'm going to do the, you know, the big job thing, enough of being a loser now. Um, and I did my um, electrical engineering. And, and that was really hard, because you come from this wildly creative place to sitting there. And I mean, I'm, I was Afrikaans, and I had to study in English, and I was going to be an artist, <laughs> and so my, you know, my grades weren't that good. So I really, really had to almost prune half of my mind in order to grow this other side. And I then got my doctorate. Um, but just to give you an idea of how it works, is you have this insight, you're like, oh, I know, I'm doing human action recognition with video cameras, and I'm going to use negative space, because artists use negative space. Okay, and that's a great insight, but it, le it takes six years of coding <laughs> to get your doctorate there. <laughs> so. But then the problem was, where's all the pictures? Where's the sculptures? You know, where's the passion? Where's, where's the soul? And um, it's about 2006 that I first saw um, images of 3D printing, and I was like, yeah, that sounds amazing. I also want to do that. <coughs> but there was nowhere around me um, where I could study it. So um, I went to, I'm just going to click that over. All right, so just, I, the slides are going a bit quick, so I'm just, I did my postdoctorate in medical implant design to learn about 3D printing. Um, then I went, um, and these are 3D printed, centered items. Okay, so that's the chrysanthemum centerpiece. Uh, this is the Birdman. Now what's amazing about 3D printing is, unfortunately that slide was quick, but it's a thin layer of powder, okay? And then everywhere my CAD design that I made on computer is, it, it melts it, all right? So what I do is I build these things and everything is inside, okay? So when it goes out of the printer, it comes out of the printer just like that and you start moving it. So all the thinking is at the beginning. And just to give you an idea of, again, because I pruned half my head, <laughs> you know, I had to go back to some of the drawings I did at school for inspiration. And then it, just to look at the Birdman on the inside, you can see all the, you know, you're working on two worlds, the, the CAD world and, um, and then the centered file. Another one is the, the horse marionette, which I'm proud to say is in the London Science Museum for two years. Um, and this also amazing one because you, I have to think of absolutely everything. How is it going to work? You know, and I usually leave the box right there for a while because you know, when it comes back, cause you, you email this file to the printers and they, they post back a box to you and you sit with this box. But it came out perfectly. And you know, when I strung it, its little feet was running. So I was so impressed. I was so happy. And, <laughs> and that, again, you know, the going back to when I was at school, some of the puppets and things I made then. The, the, this image on this shows you the digital sculpting. There's like two worlds at the moment. The one is the animation world, where the sculpting comes from, and then the other is the engineering world, where the more the gears and the stuff comes from. And the two is, you know, 
quite a pain to interact. Uh, this is an image of Una. Uh, it's a little hand raised springbok that I had. Um, and there's again, it's showing you just the inside. It actually got little gears, also prints in one go. This is the sea dog. All right. And the image showing, I make little drawings to make it exactly on scale. And um, just the next list I'm wearing is a direct metal print. So it was printed in one go. It's not assembled afterwards, and it's bronze. So, uh, and you can also, because it's a digital file, you can make a big one. So this is the, the freedom that comes with. And then um, Joshua Hawker was doing a fashion piece for the 3D printer, so I'm like, I also want to be a fashion designer. <laughs> so, so this is, gives you an idea of how I do things. I'm like, mm, I want to do this. So um, I said to Kerry, can I do a fashion piece? And then she's like, yeah, if you've, if you've got something to do. And then I was like, OK, so I, I'm I met Daniel Dukowski from Stratasys at a conference I was speaking, and he was, do you want to uh, you know, experiment with some of our um, printers? And I was like, absolutely, and you know, there's a fashion show that I'm going to be part of. And then I met Euphoria as well, and so, so I kind of sit here in South Africa, but I'm connecting with the world, and I'm not part of a company, big company, or a university, so it's, it's the power of the internet and what you can do. So this is an example of... The, I was working with Stratasys um, on designs for this piece before the machine was even released. It's a multicolor, multi-material printer. So you can get hard and soft parts, and you can get different colors in the same print. So I make a design on a computer that I don't touch, and I send the emails to Tal at, um, at Stratasys, and he prints it out. And that comes from all this, these different colors or from one printer, it just prints. It's, it's really amazing. Some of the images, beautiful Lerato Malloy, they modeled some. Um, you can see them with shoes, soft parts, hard parts. Some extreme shoes, of course, they're not wearable, otherwise I would be wearing them now, <laughs> of course. Can't wait, you know, they're just they're so close, almost there. <laughs> and this is uh, the stained glass corset. So um, this is the interesting one, the drawing on the left, um, kind of the ideas how I progress. And the fascinating thing about this was I was um, working with the guys, and this is the first time that my drawings is what we sent. You know, I scanned images, and then somebody would say, oh, yes, it can be done, it can't be done. And that, to me, was like an interesting moment, that all of a sudden we're not using text anymore, but we're, we're communicating with drawings. Um, the image on the right, <laughs> whichever side, <laughs> um, that's Euphoria software. Now, what's interesting about the, the corset is it takes body scan data in, and it literally fits this corset around any body. So it's the future, customizable. You know, you don't have loads of stock in a shop. You just, you know, you, you send them your data, your shoe size or something, and get scanned in, and this design is put on it. And there's, again, beautiful Lerato, and photographed by Marvelian von der Marwe. So I hope that you agree with me that art and engineering is a perfect couple. <laughs> and I also hope that you've picked up on the fact that there's this whole industry of manufacturing, injection molding, you know, huge things that are, that are just being bypassed. Because I sit in the middle of nowhere, I'll show you an image of where I sit just now, and, and I manufacture. You know, I, I, can, I can print and do almost everything I want to. Whatever I create in my mind, I've got to understand how the technology works, uh, there's limitations and things. But this is really empowering. This is a very interesting future we, we're moving into. Um, and this is part of disruptive innovation. Just like the printing press all of a sudden gave people um, books to read and we could share stories and knowledge and learning and none of us are using a quill anymore, we write with pens and pencils. Um, personal computers, you know, I've been in front of many of these waves. Um, the internet, when I first did my PhD, I was one of the first groups um, to use the internet at UCT. Smartphones, I mean, all of us have one, we love it, it just, it just moves in and replaces, or sometimes there wasn't even anything like that. So, but nobody's really spreading this word about this interesting technology. And the, the interesting part about disruptive technology is you don't have to have such a huge learning curve. You know, it means that you can jump in there. Just like I didn't know what, you know, that nobody else had a 3D pr um, a computer and I just started using it. In the same way, today, you can get children to just, just stop playing with it. They wouldn't even know it's like super new and revolutionary. You know, they'll, they'll just go for it and it doesn't matter what kind of kids. And also people, people from different industries. And I, I haven't been 
hearing people, you know, giving this message. So I started Agents of the Three Revolution. And this is where I live, just to give you an idea why it's important for me. It's because I live nowhere. I'm not inside a technological area. I'm literally sitting behind my computer, this like window to the world, you know, that I communicate with. And uh, we did U University of Johannesburg sponsored the space, and um, we had some of the best 3D print artists coming in and telling us their stories. And we had technology demonstrations, and thanks to the Vol University of Technology, some design courses. Um, and then the question is, how do I do this? You know, because I, I basically work on fumes. It's the gift network. You know, so you know, I've got family, friends, and they look after the children, and don't think that when I call people, they can just hear with the tone of my voice, I'm going to ask something, you know. So, and I've got a um, lovely friend, Maria Paula McGurk, who um, also utilized her gift network, you know, to make things happen, so that, you know, you can't just do things that are new um, and, and get loads of sponsors to stand in line to do it. You've, it's got to be driven from your side. But the problem is, at the beginning of this year, I was, I've got two little children, and I was, I'm not going to, you know, things happen, life always, things happen. Um, but unfortunately, I had these two projects, the, the, the fashion piece, and I was running, and I had to run so many things at the same time, and the kids, and it was just, um, my health just went completely gone, and I had to pull in my own finances to to do certain things, because, you know, when I say I'm going to do it, and I believe in these things, and I, I want to do this. Um, and I was so ill as well, just lit literally ill, um, and my doctor thought I had cancer, and that just completely made me stop. I was like, you know, I, I can't do this to my family anymore, you know, I'm, I'm driving like a mad thing. Um, and, and why? What, what's, you know, why is this not working? So the big question was, if you work so hard, which I do, and I do so many things, like, you know, some, often they tell you in life, like, follow your passion, you know, and, and things will kind of happen, but why isn't it happening for me? Um, and then, I, and then I, it all started kind of making sense. And I realized, you know, I love exploring the unknown. I'm like, you know, if, if there's anything new, I'm like checking out the scene, you know, and if there's, oh, and like target it, you know, start emailing, and I don't mind if people don't email me back, I will email them again, <laughs> you know. I don't, just don't give up. And, um, and this is where my big insight was, is the world that we live in kind of world looks like this. You have, on the one end, you have the marketplace. These are where products are that we know of, you know. Um, and the marketplace looked different 20 years ago, and it looked different in the future, and it looks different in Japan. These are the things we know and we value, okay? And I want these shoes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But how how do these things come into the known? How do these things change? It's people sit there and they think of new ideas, and you say, I want to I want to write a book or something. So. So you have to have people thinking of ideas, and those ideas have to mature, and then they go into marketplace where they can be something you can buy. You can't buy a book before somebody's written it. <laughs> you, know? you, you can't have a product until somebody's developed it. So there's a space where these things haven't happened yet. They're just kind of ideas in people's heads. And universities know that, because research departments, PhD students get money. They're not supposed to support themselves, the university supports them, so that they can go on this journey of learning and discover things. Even religions know that. Churches and temples and mosques have property. They, they're grounded um, you know, in, in, a, in a church, there are services, but this allows, say, a monk to go on a journey of enlightenment. He's not supposed to be able to have to support himself and go on this journey. Okay, so. So what kind of people live in this, this unknown world? You know, if you, a lot of artists live there. You're trying to make something. You, you can't sell a painting unless you've painted it. Writers are there. Researchers, you don't know if the work that you've done has got any meaning or will provide financial support until you've done it. Um, a lot of open source software is there. It's kind of a, in the gift economy. People change things and work on other people's code until it becomes something, you know, that they can use. Inventors, and it's, it's the gift economy that I work in. You know, a lot of people, if they think it's interesting, they'll spend their time and energy working with me on something, even though they don't actually get paid for it. So this is an interesting graph. This is the Gartner hype cycle. This is when new technology enters the world. So at the beginning, you'll have an idea, and then you can Google this Gartner, and you can see for different new technologies how far on this curve it is. 
Um, so there's this peak of inflated expectations. Um, 3D printing commercial is right there now. So people think, wow, it's going to do everything for them. And then it's going to go, it's now on the, just peaking over, it's on the negative press side. And then it's going to go to the trough of disillusionment. Okay. But what's interesting is this is exactly the same for the creative process. You're like, oh, I want to do something in the area. And then you're like, oh, this is going to be amazing. It's such a cool thing. You know? Or somebody says you can do a TED talk, and you're like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, I want to do that. And then you move into the trough of disillusionment when you're like, why did I think that's a good idea? I suck at this. <laughs> you know? And most creatives, everybody will tell you, you know, the slope is either it's like forever long, like doctorate, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a rhythm, and I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out. The rhythm is always the same. So, so if in the marketplace um, you are valued by how much money you get for a product, okay. So success in the marketplace is money. If you've got a very highly valued job, you'll get lots of money for it. But what is the value to the explorers? Because as I've just said, while you're working on it, you can't have money. You can't value it. So that answer is, I'm afraid, only you can know. You are the explorer. You are the one, you know, going out there. Nobody else has been there. Nobody can tell you what you're doing is good if you're going to succeed. And you've just got to have faith in yourself, trust yourself that you're taking the journey. And don't be like Van Gogh. Don't despair. You know, when you're not hearing these voices coming, you're not feeling the love of the money, it's, it's okay. <laughs> you know? You're not alone. I'm also there. <laughs> <All right>. Thank you. <laughs>